This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. Joe's father served in World War II in the US Air Force. His service inspired Joe to try and join the US Air Force or the Navy Air Force despite having no flying experience. It's the aftermath of the Vietnam War, so forces are being reduced. However, with the arrival of a new president, Ronald Reagan, defense spending grows and provides Joe with an opportunity to start pilot training with the US Air Force. He eventually ends up flying the A-10, which was first introduced into service in 1976 and was designed to provide close air support to ground troops by attacking armoured vehicles, tanks and other enemy ground forces. Joe describes what makes the A-10 special, as well as his training and initial deployment to Alaska. You get a real pilot's eye view of flying the plane, including navigation techniques and the challenges of flying at low level. Don't miss part two next week where Joe is sent to the 92nd Fighter Squadron at RAF Bentwaters in the UK, just over 50 miles from where his father served in World War II. I'm delighted to welcome Joe to our Cold War conversation. It all goes back to my father. Um, He was a uh, B-26 Marauder pilot in the European theater in World War II. Uh, In fact, he was stationed uh, for the first half of his his wartime tour at what is now Stansted Airport uh, with the uh, 344th Bomb Group. And uh, eventually they they migrated into France after D-Day. Um, but when he came back, uh, he put all of his stuff in a footlocker. Uh, he, he mustered out right after the war. And um, then he went to work for the uh, Federal Aviation Administration, which is, I think your equivalent is the CAA, uh, as an air traffic controller, and he never spoke about uh, his wartime experience. Um, when I was about 11, I came across that footlocker, and it was just like a treasure trove. It was uh, all of his uniforms, his, uh, his medals. Uh, uh, he had a big uh, photo album uh, full of the airplanes and the people that he, he flew with, and I was just fascinated. And that kind of put the the nugget in my head that uh, that might be something I wanted to do, but um, in the short term, it wasn't a factor. I we didn't have the money uh, to get me flying lessons, and uh, and it really never occurred to me that uh, maybe I wanted to be a qualified pilot before I applied to the uh, Air Force or the Navy, uh, which I did both, um, and so I just let that matriculate along until college. And I uh, remember this was uh, the late 70s. This was uh, post-Vietnam uh, for the U.S. And so we were in the process of actually drawing down the military significantly from the Vietnam era of uh, manpower. So uh, while I was in college, I applied to both the Navy and the Air Force uh, a couple of times and was told, sorry, no, we're, we're downsizing. We're not adding people. And so that depressed me. And uh, uh, I received my degree in 1980, uh, and I was going to go into law enforcement, uh, which is what my degree was in. Uh, So I worked some odd jobs, and I thought uh, as the election for president came around in 1980, I thought, well, I'll give it one more try. And if you'll remember, that's when Ronald Reagan was first elected. Uh, And sure enough, uh, as soon as he was elected uh, in the fall of '80. I put another application package in, which was going to be the the last one I was giving up. And of course, uh, he upsized the military significantly to deal with Soviet threat, uh, which had kind of been backburnered in the in the course of Vietnam. And I was lucky enough to fall into that that first uh, drop of uh, of manpower that uh, really added to the uh, the combat capability of the of the U.S. and And that, you know, that hiring and those numbers kept going up until probably, I would guess, the mid 80s. Um, But I was fortunate to get into one of those first batches of uh, applicants who was accepted. Did you just go straight into pilot training or or how how did they test your aptitude as to whether you would be suitable? (laughs) 
So there was an aptitude test, uh, a written aptitude test, and um, it was pretty generic, but it, it, it addressed some flying aspects, basic stuff, uh, some navigation aspects, uh, and then just some general aircraft stuff. Uh, and at the end of uh, the test, when it was graded out, the, the recruiter told me, you know, I've got some bad news. You're not qualified to be a navigator. Uh, but you are qualified to be a pilot, <laughs> which sounded backwards to me. And I went, oh, thank goodness for that. But uh, so that was just to basically prove that you weren't, gosh, I guess functionally illiterate because uh, it, it wasn't difficult. But uh, that that got you into the door for the application for a pilot slot. And then subsequent to that, once you got, like, when I went to officer training school, which is how I was commissioned, uh, there was a, a four-week uh, a flying portion at the beginning of that, flying a Cessna 172, which, again, was just to show basic aptitude. And I think you got about 20 hours and you soloed, uh, and that was just to prove to them that you, A, you didn't get sick in an airplane, B, you didn't panic. Uh, and see you could take instruction basically uh, and we had people that did the first two of those and dropped out because uh, they were hiring so many people that not everybody was going to be suited for it uh, and that weeded out a fair number of people and then after that was over you were already at the location for officer training school so then you went into the 12 week officer training school curriculum uh, and came out at the end of that as a shiny new second lieutenant what, how did your father feel about you uh, joining the Air Force? I think he was very proud. He, he was a quiet guy. You know, he never, he never, even after I became a fighter pilot, uh, would share his wartime experiences. Uh, I, mean, I understand it. He was 22 years old when they flew their D-Day missions over the beach at Omaha. So that marks a person. You know, he was maybe the second oldest person in that crew, but uh, I think he was quietly very proud. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, uh, I never got any pushback from my mother or my dad. Now my mother, just as a, a point of interest, had lost a brother in World War II who was killed by flak in a B-24, uh, over Austria. Um, so they both had experiences with that, but it never, it, it never came into play as far as me signing up. So freshly minted second lieutenant, what, what's the next steps in, uh, your career? So it was uh, pilot training, which was uh, about an 11-month course. Uh, at that time, I think we had five pilot training bases. Uh, I ended up in Mississippi, uh, at Columbus, Mississippi, and uh, you pretty much went straight into the pilot training course. And again, it, uh, it started with um, a lot of ground academics uh, and some testing. Uh, and then you, uh, your first airplane uh, was a jet, you know, the the vaunted T-37, uh, which was a side-by-side -side, uh, twin, uh, twin jet airplane that originated in the 1950s. So, you know, it had no air conditioning uh, in Mississippi in the summertime. Uh, but it was really perfect for what they wanted to get out of it, which is to basically train someone like me. And I, I was the perfect example that the Air Force could train anybody uh, to fly if, you, you know, they had basic aptitude because I had no previous flight experience at all. Uh, and so you, you went into the T-37 for a, a period of time and then transitioned into the, uh, the T-38, which I think your the, uh, Rick Shreve talked about a little bit, uh, in, in his podcast. Rick Shreve's episode is episode 193. There'll be a link in the episode information. Uh, which was a completely different animal, uh, supersonic capable airplane that was that was pretty twitchy, uh, but lo just lovely to fly. And that was your next step. And that's what got you to the end, end point of getting up an assignment was those two airplanes. And it took about 11 months total. How many people sort of didn't make it through those 11 months? Well, I was trying to think. We, we didn't have that many washout um we did have a couple, surprisingly, that had uh, motion sickness issues. Um, 
In fact, I don't remember anybody washing out of my T-37 class. I may be wrong because that was a long time ago, but um, we had a couple that, and strangely enough, one of them had, had over 300 hours in, in twin engine airplanes, civilian, uh, but they got sick every time they flew in a T-37. Uh, and so they took those people out and washed them back and sent them to the medical facility in Texas uh, to try to get them over that. Uh, rather than just chopping them, uh, which you know, may have happened in the RAF, uh, they went to lengths to get them past that that uh, particular problem. And in both cases, both of those people came back and uh, and made it. Wow. I wonder what the cure was. Yeah, I don't think you want to know what the cure was. I, I think they they tried to make them so sick so often that they just got tired of it and then their body finally adapted. You know, is, is basically what I got out of that. Wow. So a bit like getting sea legs in the Navy. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, you, you have to remember, uh, we all went from, uh, in almost all cases, having never flown to having uh, a helmet and a G-suit and an oxygen mask over your face. Uh, and it was very restricting. And and then you climbed into an un an air conditioned airplane in the summer in Mississippi, and so you were you were uh, sweating profusely and probably dehydrated by the end of it. And so it was a pretty it was a pretty bizarre transition from not having any flight time to being in that predicament. And it just it took some people longer to adjust than others. I can imagine. So when you reach the end of that that training, what are you wanting to fly? at that point do you do you know what you want to what you want to fly well at that point uh early 80s uh you 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 all flew the same airplanes now they've split it off so that if you're going to be a, a heavy pilot you know a cargo pilot or or bombers you go to a different airplane for the second half but in our curriculum Everyone threw the, flew the T-37, and uh, everyone flew the T-38. And at about the two-thirds point, uh, they had a uh, chop where they decided, okay, you are fighter qualified, and they called it FAR, Fighter Attack Reconnaissance, uh, or you are uh, tanker bomber, something else qualified, so big airplanes. Uh, so once you got to that point, and that was a big deal. We There was a party and everything to tell people what they were going to which track they were going to go down because that changed the last portion of the curriculum. And so I knew I wanted to fly fighters, always had, you know, that was, that was my dream. And my performance was good enough, uh, wasn't top of the class by any means, but it was good enough that I was fighter qualified. Uh, and after that point that narrows down, okay, your choices to, you know, fighter reconnaissance or attack airplanes. And so it, it it chopped it down from I don't know how many airplanes are in the inventory to those those few that are one or two place airplanes, uh, and it's really funny. I I found my original dream sheet is what we called it, and it was uh, where you had to write down every airplane in the in the inventory and where you wanted it uh, rank wise, and then which portion of the country or overseas that you wanted to go to. And my first choice was an A-10. And uh, I remember that because uh, when I was a stupid second lieutenant at the desk of the T-37 instructor, he had two pictures under his glass. And one of them was an F-15 or something. And the other one was an A-10. And I had no earthly idea what that thing was. And I said, oh, that looks cool. What's that? And uh, he explained what it was. I said, yeah, yeah, I want to fly that. I mean, just complete ignorance on my part. But uh, then I started looking around at it and actually saw one perform in the local air show and was just fascinated by it. It was single seat, it was ground attack, uh, and that was something I could reach for because at that time, the A-10 was not, obviously, the premier fighter that the top 10% was going to go for. Uh, and I knew that I was not going to get an F-15 or an F-16, might get an F-4, might get an A-7, but I thought I had a pretty good shot at an A-10, and so it was. It was my first choice. Wow. But they were probably quite surprised at that, or not? 
it, the funny part was my T-38 flight commander uh, was this salty old Vietnam guy. And uh, I think he'd flown A-7s in Vietnam, but he, he flew A-10s uh, in the early days, in, in, in the late 70s when they first came out. And so he was, he was proud as punch, <laughs> you know, and I didn't care about the rest of them because I, I was never going to see these guys again anyway. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it wasn't the, it wasn't the first choice. I mean, but not the most, not the most glamorous aircraft people, uh, some people might say to fly. Can you just describe the A-10 for those that aren't familiar with it? It was developed in the, in the mid seventies and, and, and I do, I, I, truly believe it was really developed as a follow-on for uh, the A-1 Sky Raider, which was uh, used in Vietnam as a low, slow ground attack air- aircraft that could uh, support uh, downed pilot extractions. We called them Sandy missions uh, and uh, provide you know ground support for them and, uh, and go in and see targets at a slower speed than most every other fighter could. Uh, and be able to engage them. And the other part of that was to give it enough firepower so that uh, when it did go in, uh, it could devastate whatever was there in the shortest period of time. And that it usually meant forward firing ordnance. And so this 30 millimeter gun that the A-10 ended up with, uh, you could almost say that the airplane was built around the gun in, in a certain sense, because that was the kind of firepower they wanted. I don't know that it was ever intended uh, to be what it became as a Warsaw Pact tank killer, but that was a that was a benefit of the way it was built, and and it, it was so it's basically a straight wing, uh, two engine airplane. The, the engines are separated at the back. It's twin tails. Uh, it has a super amount of redundancy in almost every system. The hydraulics, you have two hydraulic systems and a third backup system for flight controls. Uh, you have uh, self-sealing fuel tanks. Now we're talking about the A model, which basically follows onto the C model as far as the airframe. But uh, it had uh, so self-sealing fuel tanks. It had a an armored bathtub that the air, the pilot sat in, which was uh, was supposed to be able to take up to twenty-three millimeter hits and uh, and and keep it out of the cockpit with you. Um, you had uh, eleven weapons pylons under it. So you could carry a variety of ordnance, and uh, we did, uh, uh, both in the uh, you know, the European scenario and other places. The gun obviously was was the biggest uh, the biggest thing on it. it. The gun is about eighteen feet long from the ammo can to the tip of the barrels. Seven barrel Gatlin gun. Uh, I know your listeners can't see it, but that's that's one of the shells. It's just under a foot long. Um, this is wow, all. That's, that's bigger than I, I'd imagined. Yeah. Uh, it can carry 1,174 of them, uh, whereas most other weapons of a smaller caliber, probably they could carry more, but it doesn't have as much punch. Uh, they came with three different warheads, uh, armor-piercing, high incendiary, uh, and we had a, a target practice uh, piece, which was just a, you know, a, a solid metal projectile for uh, for target practice. Um, so it was it was built for that kind of mission, which lent itself to other missions as well as as Vietnam went away, and they transitioned into uh, more of a, a Soviet incursion kind of mindset in Central Europe. Um, but it uh, carried a lot of forward firing. We carried uh, Maverick missiles. If we could shoot a Maverick at oh, a T-64 or a T-72, it didn't matter where you hit it because a Maverick's going to blow it up. Uh, but the gun was a little more problematic. And uh, you know, we, we carried a bunch of freefall ordnance that was armor-penetrating ordnance. Uh, but we didn't want to do that because now you're, you're overflying the entire, probably the entire threat area. Uh, so standoff was really what we had going for us. I mean, it... As a, as a rule, we would we would shoot soft skin vehicles out to about six thousand feet, uh, tanks into about four. You didn't want to get much inside of that, but Maverick you could stand off anywhere from, depending on the the mark of Maverick, anywhere from two to five miles. You know, 
uh, for tactical sized targets. Um, and how was that Maverick steered? Ours were launch and leave. They were all, uh, the, they called it EO, electro optical, so a TV screen that had trackers, tracking gates in it. Uh, so what you had to have was was definition. You had to have edges uh, so that you'd, you'd lock it onto the target edges. Uh, and then it had polarity so you could select whether it's light or a dark target. So light target, dark background would be one way and then the other way around. Uh, once you got a good lock, then you just fired it and it, it tracked itself to the target. Uh, the, later, uh, the later one we got was the infrared uh, so you could depending on the day it might be a, a hot target on a cold background or vice versa and you could select that and then the same concept but you could zoom in closer with the seeker head so you could see it further out uh lock it up uh, with good edges and it's telling you everything's good and you just launch that thing off too so you could stand much further off with uh usually the ir was the best and, and that goes back to the visibility thing ir is usually going to see through most things that uh your naked eye can't see through so you know some some caveats to that but in in most cases that was the case they carry a lot more now but back in the mid 80s we had really maverick missiles were the only other forward firing ordnance besides rockets 2.75 rockets that we could carry uh, but we carried up uh, just an abundance of free fall ordnance, cluster weapons. Uh, we got into laser guided bombs later, but uh, for that high threat Central Europe, it was going to be mostly Maverick and uh, and gun, and uh, and then hopefully we never got to the free fall ordnance part where you had to overfly the bad guys to to drop things on them, which was never good. How many rounds a minute could this thing fire? It was uh, originally. When I trained on it in 83, uh, there were two rates of fire. So 4,200 rounds a minute and I think 2,400 rounds a minute. So you could go high rate or low rate. I was never really sure why you did that. So 4,200 rounds a minute was originally the the top. Uh, at some point, uh, I don't know if it was because of air, air, aircraft fatigue because of the lower rate of fire. But they took out two rates of fire and then lowered the the single rate to 3,900 rounds per minute. Uh, so you get about 70 out a second, a little under 70 per second, um, which is pretty significant when you consider that the way they built the gun, 80% of the projectiles at 4,000 feet slant range land within 40 feet of the target, which is it, it's pretty, pretty awesome when you think about it. Uh, Obviously, as you go out in slant range, uh, then that dispersion increases. But uh, heart of the envelope, that 4,000 feet was, uh, you know, 80% of uh, whatever you shot is going to be at or near the target. Incredible. Incredible. And you, you mentioned the different types of ammunition. Did you just have one type uh, mission or could you select the different types? Well, for... Uh, for wartime, uh, Central Region, uh, our mix was five to one armor piercing to HEI, high explosive incendiary. Uh, so the ammo was all belt fed and it was loaded with five API to one HEI. And they had a big belt, automatic belt feeder to load the drum. So that's what you got. You couldn't, you couldn't mix and match, uh, once you got in the airplane. Now you, there were talk, there was talk at some points about maybe going to three API to two HEI, but again, it would have had to have been you know preloaded in that fashion, and and then that's what you would get. But five to one was our normal high threat mix. Thirty millimeter caliber doesn't sound huge when you compare it to the caliber of a main battle tank. So. Is that effective because you're generally firing, well, you, you are firing down on top of the target where the armor is likely to be weaker? Is that the theory there? Well, no doubt the, the front of the turret of a T-64 or a T-72 uh, is not where we wanted to be shooting because we would have had to get in very close uh, to have the desired weapons effects. 
But it, it, this is funny, Ian, because uh, when I first showed up at Bentwaters in 85, one of the first things I was handed was called an A10 coloring book. And it was it was uh, a T T64 or T72 tank. Uh, and, and it was put out by the weapon shop. And the whole gist of it was, okay, guys, you know, you got to go kill these tanks, but let us tell you where to kill them, you know, because everything other than that front uh, part of the turret is more vulnerable uh, to our fire. Uh, and no doubt uh, a main tank round from one of our tanks is probably going to do the job. Uh, 30 millimeter, I think it would, I think the number I remember is it would go through 55 millimeters of, uh, of rolled armor which is probably not enough to get through that front portion of the, of the tank. But if you look at all the other aspects of the tank, if you shoot it from the side, if you shoot it from the back, if you shoot it from the top, then you have you know excellent penetration capability. Uh, so we were always going to, if we had to shoot it in the lips, we were going to do that. Uh, but our preference was, was going to try to be to find an angle to hit other parts of the tank. And maybe we, if you just get a mobility kill, you know, if you can stop him, blow some treads off, then he's done, uh, especially in a moving fight. So yeah, if we could hit him from the side or the back, absolutely the top, we probably weren't going to get that high in a, in a central European scenario because, uh, we're going to get shot down if we did. So all of our, uh, tactics, you know, for that scenario were pretty much, you, know, you go in at 100 feet, you you bump up or pop up high enough to get target acquisition, and you shoot your Maverick at it, uh, or you go in and strafe it. Uh, so yeah, the battle tanks were an issue, and you know later in in the 80s, the the uh, the Soviets started putting reactive armor on the fronts of all their battle tanks to try to dissipate the effect of our incoming round. So that made it even more difficult. And more important that we find other aspects of the tank to shoot at. But anything else, uh, we could pretty much saw up. You know, any anything other than the main battle tank, uh, that that mix was gonna was gonna do some damage. Now the the plane is is probably not one of the prettiest planes, um, and therefore uh, had a um, not a very flattering nickname for it. It's all in the eye of the beholder, Ian. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how the warthog thing yeah. came out. The most just, beautiful plane you ever flew, I know. Uh, it was my first girlfriend, you know. Uh, I think because it was down in the dirt, you know, that's how the warthog came about. Uh, we sure didn't. Nobody called it a Thunderbolt too. It's like nobody calls an F-16 a fighting falcon, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it, it probably had more to do with being down in the weeds and uh, and, and rooting around like hogs that uh, it was called but uh, it was already called that by the time I came into it in 83. So I don't know where the, where the provenance of that is. Can you remember your first flight in one of these? Uh, I remember parts of it. Well, because the first flight uh, is solo. Uh, there were no two-seat A-10s. Um, we received what they called simulator training, but even the simulator was terrible. It was basically uh, no visual and so you could go through all the instrumentation work and everything, and you could do the all the checklists and and all that. But uh, you know, it was back to the 1940s, man. It was a single seat airplane, and your first trip, you climbed up the ladder by yourself and and made it happen. But uh, the airplane is so easy to fly. Uh, employment's different, but just flying of it, big straight wing. You know, it's uh, there's no afterburners, so it you, you know you you put the throttles in the far left front quadrant and you know it eases down the runway and picks up speed and then all of a sudden you're flying Uh, and so that was pretty awesome it was uh something that no one else in the fighter community could say they did and uh we were uh, we were kind of the only ones and it was simply because the airplane was easy to fly now you had you did have an instructor pilot and another airplane chasing you uh, so he was right off your wing and kind of behind you, uh, but far enough behind you. So if you screwed up, you weren't going to run into him, but, uh, he was there to give you, uh, instruction, but, uh, yeah, it was all on you. And, uh, it was a really cool thing. Everybody, everybody who came back from their first flight had a huge grin on their face. Wow. Wow. 
Yeah, no, that is really like going going back to World War Two. There, incredible. Um, and was it quite ma- a maneuverable aircraft? Oh, very, very. Um, again, big straight wing. Uh, so you had a lot of wing area, uh, and if you were up at uh, a good maneuvering speed, you could you could turn around and gosh. 2,500 foot turn radius, maybe something like that, maybe even less uh, at 5G. Uh, and our our G limit was low compared to other fighters, but it was all we needed, you know. And so you could get turned around, and you could cause uh, fast movers problems, which we uh, which we did routinely uh, in Germany when we were at the uh, the detachments, the FOLs. Uh, and you we'll come onto that later, but. Uh, I, you could surprise them at how quickly you could turn around and face them and uh, and take away their advantage, especially if they had never seen you before or they didn't know what you're capable of. We'll we're, we're come on to uh, the uh, air-to-air tactics in a moment. Um, I'm sure you can remember the first time you fire that Gatling. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's kind of startling a little bit because even in the cockpit, it makes... A fair bit of noise, uh, and if you've ever uh, heard it on uh, on YouTube or whatever, you know it's it, it, it's pretty impressive, uh, and in the cockpit even more so. It's the sound of an A10 firing its Gatling gun. You get a little bit of that smell, you know, of, of cordite or gunpowder or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I will say that it does not slow the airplane down, uh, you know, as I've read in, in other places. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, you squeeze the trigger and you first the first time you kind of come off of it quickly because it's like, whoa, you know, what is that? Uh, but you get used to that pretty quick, pretty quickly. And then then they have to tell you to stop shooting. You know, uh, you're shooting too many rounds. It's like, OK, well, it's too much fun. So your your first stationed operationally, I think, in in Alaska, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And you know, that's funny because I don't remember doing this, but I put it as my second choice. Uh, and when I got it, I was like, "Oh my God, what have I done?" What was your first choice? Uh, Bill Waters. Okay. Okay. And uh, I thought Korea stand-stood. was third. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No civvy flying, but uh, yeah, it was uh, Alaska. Um, Interesting place, uh, beautiful country, and the flying was just outstanding. Uh, we were a, a standalone squadron of, of 24 airplanes, so a bigger squadron, and uh, we had the run of the of the entire north of Alaska. Uh, we had the best ranges, and uh, we could go about wherever we wanted to, and so the flying was great. Uh, for me, as a brand new lieutenant, it was it was a really good environment to go into, because I got a lot of a lot of time getting trained and upgraded, and I, and I got to see a lot of different terrain types. Uh, but the the interesting thing about Alaska was we were kind of we weren't a squadron without a mission, but it wasn't like uh, Central Germany or Korea or something like that. We were backfill for Korea. And if World War III happened in Europe, uh, our primary mission was going to be to protect Alaska <laughs> using the troops that were there from any kind of incursion. So we worked with uh, Eskimo scout troops a lot uh, who were indigenous, and uh, we'd go go try to find them and, and, and support them up in the, in the wilds of northern Alaska. But we never, never really had that uh, kind of in-your-face threat to... You know, you, you kind of want to have as a lieutenant, you want to have a focus for the bad where the bad guys are, and you want them to be close by. Yeah, it was, uh, but it was great flying. What was your mission supposed to be in Alaska? Because you're you're miles away from from the main threat, albeit you've got the Soviet Union just over the Bering Strait. Well, we were never really clear on you know how that was going to work. We didn't know if it would be like, you know, Japan in World War Two. Uh, tried to take over the Aleutian Islands. And so th- that was a fight nobody ever heard about. Uh, so we didn't know if it would be like that or they would be coming into the into the mainland of Alaska. Uh, 
but we were going to be there. We were probably tertiary fill for Europe if it all started going badly. Uh, but we weren't going on the first wave or the second wave. So yeah, it was, uh, we were, we'd go up there and train with them and, uh, and it was fun. Uh, it was challenging, uh, but it was, uh, just kind of a different feel to, uh, what the frontline units were doing in other places. In Alaska, were you practicing the, the low altitude navigation, um, skills as well there? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and perfect terrain for it because the way we did low altitude nav was called Latin, uh, low altitude tactical navigation. And we would take, uh, mostly a one to two fifty thousand scale map, um, you know, you draw black lines on it and time ticks uh, just to give you a, a relative idea. Okay, if I want to get from point A to point D, how long is it going to take me, say, to get from uh, a navigation to an initial point to make an attack? So you do all that, but in, in practice, what you really did, and they taught this at the initial training, got you started on it, was to go from terrain feature to terrain feature and use those terrain features for uh, direct or indirect terrain masking. So bad guys coming in above you couldn't see you, or maybe, or maybe the ground threats over here couldn't couldn't pick you out because you're below the ridge line. But to use those terrain features to get you from point A to point D, rather than just flying a black line. Uh, and and we did that. That was critical. Uh, it was easier, almost easier in Alaska to do it because there was so much terrain. You know, you could you could pick things out. In Europe, in five clicks of viz, uh, at 300 feet or whatever, you really had to be on your game to be able to march yourself down the, we called it thumbing down the map because you, you'd see where you were, put your thumb there, and then, you know, go to the next point and, and work your way to the next uh, turn point. Uh, but a lot tougher in Europe than it was uh, in Alaska just because of the visibility, weather, and and the terrain features that were available. Did your father give you any uh, tips about life in the UK when you told him you were going to Bentwaters? You know, uh, no, not really. Uh, he didn't like warm beer. I remember that, uh, which I loved it. You know, I, th- I thought it was great because it really wasn't warm, but uh, I think his time there was a little bit uh, more fraught with stress than, than mine ever was. And, uh, so, no, he, he didn't really have much to say about the UK as, you know, the weather, of course, but uh, uh, he uh, he was pretty quiet on the whole thing. So, did you fly your aircraft over to Bent Waters, or was it already there? Uh, no. So, I was in Alaska for 18 months. Uh and Alaska was considered an overseas tour. Um, at the end of that, I was not considered uh, experienced. So they had to send me to another uh, operational unit. And our assignment process is such that uh, you put in your requests, and then some guy in an office a thousand miles away is the one who fills them. So I was never supposed to go to Bentwaters. I begged for it. I put Bentwaters first, uh, Korea second, because I'd been to Korea on an exercise. And you talk about a squadron with a mission. I mean, that that was that was fantastic. I, I really love that. But uh, So I get my assignment back, and it's like, no, you're going to Louisiana <laughs> instead. Uh, and so I figured that was that. And uh, uh, just a few weeks before uh, I was supposed to, leave Alaska, uh, that detailer called me up and said, look, we've had somebody, uh, lose their flying category because of illness. So we need to fill a slot at Bentwaters. Do you want it? And, uh, of course I jumped all over it. Uh, and, and that was one of the, one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me. From, and there's a few things like that, that happened that kind of drove the way my career and my life went. And if they hadn't happened, I mean, uh, we wouldn't be talking today, but uh, so yeah, I I took the assignment, uh, went home for a month, and then they fly you commercially into London, where we held for three hours over Heathrow because the fog was so bad you couldn't land in January. Surprise! Um, 
And then they pile you on a oh, bus. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. Uh, the whole month of January was like that. They pile you on a bus, and everybody's just, you know, knackered because it's – They've, they've been on an airplane, They now they got to get on a bus. And, you know, from Heathrow to Bentwaters was a pretty good slog uh, back then. And then you stagger off a bus uh, at Bentwaters in the cold and dark. And if you're lucky, there's someone there that that's uh, from your squadron that's there to get you. And they take you to the officer's quarters and, and deposit you there for a couple of days while your body catches up. Once your body catches up, what, what do you make of the U.K.? What are your first impressions? Cold and dark. Um, for the first week, I think I lived in officer uh, temporary officers' quarters, and um, really just didn't have. I didn't have transportation for a few days, uh, and then had to go find transportation, and then get into the squadron and start doing all the admin. So for the first week or two. I didn't get out much. Uh, and, and then the Air Force says that you have to leave because we have more incoming people, and they would farm you out to uh, hotels around the countryside that the Air Force paid for. And I ended up in a place called Saxmundum uh, at the Bell Hotel, which was run by a old Spitfire pilot from uh, the Battle of Britain. Uh, wow. And... Uh, Everybody told me this is where you need to go, and they were exactly right. I mean, it was uh, there were three or four of us pilots, new pilots there, and so every night when you uh, when you got home from work, you went into the the hotel bar and uh, drank with the uh, old Spitfire guy. He was he was a pretty salty dude, and uh, I was there for six weeks, and and so then I got to look around England and and figure out what a neat what a neat little corner of the world it was. Uh, but it was so different, Ian. Um, it just took a lot of getting used to. I was a very sheltered little Alabama boy before I joined up, but that was the, the, those were the only international locations I'd, I'd ever made it to. Yeah, and at least we speak English well, sort of, anyway. Yeah, there were there are a couple of words that I learned not to say to, someone, to an English person that uh, mean different things. Uh, my wife to be told me a couple of those that you know you don't need to say that to an English person, you might get beat up. I won't say them here either. Um, and now you've introduced you. How, how did you how did you meet your wife? Um, your future wife. She was from a village just outside Saxmundham, and she had actually worked for the proprietor of the Bell Hotel, the Spitfire guy. Uh, for a while, and they became friends, and so she would come in of an evening and uh, either bartend for him uh, or just, uh, you know, visit and stuff, and, and we met there. Uh, so if I hadn't uh, ended up at the Bell, which there's a very good chance uh, that I wouldn't end up there, I probably would never would have met her, and, you know, you can track that back all the way to, if I'd gone to Louisiana, then none of this would have happened either. So very strange how all that worked out. Wow. Wow. And did you get married in the, in the UK as well? Uh, we did. And uh, so I got there in January of 85. Uh, we married in, in September of 88. So I, I'd i been there. Then I went to fighter weapons school, came back, was there for another year. And a few months before I rotated back to the States, we, we were married. Well, lovely story. Lovely story. <laughs> I, like, I like those sort of stories. Um so back to uh, the military uh, questions. So you're in the UK. Do you have to undergo some sort of advisory training course around weather conditions and how you fly in the UK and over Europe? Oh, sure. Um, so from the time I got to Alaska, you had to undergo a mission-ready training program, uh, which took you through basically everything, uh, flying regulations, uh, weapons employment, uh, and being ready to fulfill whatever wartime tasking that the, that particular squadron had. Uh, when I got to the UK, it was the same thing. Now, because I was more experienced uh, as a wingman, and I had actually upgraded to flight lead in Alaska, they shortened my program a little bit, but it still included uh, orientation to UK airspace, uh, all the 
various rules and regulations for the USAFE, which was the U.S. Air Forces in Europe. Uh, they had their own rules compared to Alaska. And so you went through this program, and I, and I found some of that paperwork, and it was two pages of things that I had to uh, sign off on. So I had to read it, maybe take a test on it, and and then uh, and then I was good to go. But uh, the the mission ready syllabus itself took you up to a point where they they could say, okay, uh, this guy is ready to go to war in Central Europe tomorrow. Um, and part of that was a, a verification of a wartime tasking that you would stand up and brief. Uh, we had actually pre-planned uh, wartime taskings in the event it kicked off in a certain way uh, where we could go and we could target kill boxes in choke points uh, before we started doing pure close air support. And so you'd brief one of those up to the hierarchy, maybe up to the wing level, uh, to prove to them that you knew uh, exactly what weapons you had, the, the navigation portions of it, where the threats were and how to avoid them, all that stuff. And so that they were happy that, okay, he's going to be a, a viable wingman in in uh, Central Europe. So you knew the localities that you were likely to be fighting over. Sure. So you sure. knew the routes in and the terrain and go below whatever ridge line you need to go below to shield yourself and, and that sort of stuff. Well, and that came with time. Uh, that came with all the deployments we would make to the the FOLs, the forward operating locations in Germany. And, a, and each squadron was assigned to a particular FOL. So you learn that terrain and um, the the probable avenues of approach better than you knew any of the other FOLs, you might go visit them. Uh, but there were, remember, there were six, actually there were four peacetime F FOLs from Allhorn in the north. You had uh, Norvenik and uh, Simbach in the middle, which kind of was against the full to gap. And then you had Leipheim in the south. Uh, and then there were two wartime FOLs that were supposed to be secret, but I don't think they were very much which was Yaver, which was up on the North Sea coast, north of Allhorn, uh, and then uh, Wiesbaden, which was kind of in the middle of the Norvin Simbach to give, I guess, to give more bulk to that full to gap central region. Um, we were all assigned to the, to the four peace times, and uh, you, you did all of your prep and training and mission stuff in those areas, so you knew the terrain very well, and uh, you knew what, where would likely avenues of approach be you knew where they probably wouldn't come from because they couldn't get through the terrain and you kind of had an idea of okay what can i use in these places to uh, shield myself and my wingman from uh, you know from triple a and sam part two will be next week in episode 306 don't miss the episode extras such as videos photos and other content just look for the link in the podcast information the podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.